Welcome to Unscripted Authentic Leadership, podcast where we are seeking to lead change, the change that we want to see in our community, in our homes, and in our country, while also seeking to understand. I am your host, Lafayette Lane, joined by my co-host, John LeBron. We are excited, especially because we are joined for our first time with our first time guest, Jeremiah Dew, all the way from North Carolina, I believe. South Carolina. South Carolina. Mm -hmm. All the way, all the way from South Carolina. And so we have technology where we all can come together uh, while socially distancing in this time of quarantine. And so we definitely appreciate him coming on. Uh, we want him to tell us a little about what he does. And he has his own show called One Voice. And we want him to tell us about that. Before we get into that, we thank you. We want to say thank you to all of our supporters that have been supporting us and watching our podcast, uh, whether it be via YouTube, You've subscribed to the page there at Unscripted Authentic Leadership, or you have followed us on Facebook, on our Facebook page, Unscripted Authentic Leadership, uh, whether that be on Instagram, at Unscripted Leadership, or whether you've streamed our podcasts on all the various platforms of Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or uh, Buzzsprout. We definitely want to say thank you for that. So, like I said, we have our first time guest today for the first time on our uh, podcast, Jeremiah Do, Man, we appreciate you coming on. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, your family, and definitely tell us about One Voice. Appreciate you guys for having me on. Been excited about this. Uh, I'm Jay Do or Jeremiah Do, but uh, most of my people call me Jay Do, and I live in the upstate. Right. We call that the uh, northwestern corner of South Carolina. I live in Greenville with my wife and three children, six, four, and one. And uh, most people of this community over the years have recognized me from some live event. A lot of things we're not doing in 2020. So live in-person experiences with uh, minor league baseball as an MC for singing, dancing, throwing the t-shirts to all the kids and all that mess, as well as Clemson University basketball. So men's and women's basketball, I've been doing those things for uh, 10 years plus. A lot of folks saw me go there. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, in 2011, I started a one-man Black history theater type experience called One Voice, a Black History Narrative. And uh, that experience originally started in the theater, but then moved to tons and tons of civic events and schools, colleges, and corporate opportunities to be able to present, then till now, Black American history through several different character voices. And the reason I call them voices is because I become those people. There's no commentary from me about these people on why they might be important or my opinion of their political bent or my take on 2020 and beyond and what we should do. What I do is their actual speeches, their actual writings and poems and, and things like that. So Frederick Douglass, Muhammad Ali, Barack Obama, and of course, Martin Luther King, I do their speeches. I become these folks. There's videos that bring them into the into the game. And uh, I step out and, and give you their work like you're listening or watching or hearing them do it for the first time. So in the year of 2020, there's been a lot of opportunity to kind of have a better dialogue about cultural and racial divides and differences. And uh, that is where I am today as an entrepreneur in this crazy world. Wow, man, we appreciate that. And listen, just the first time I've met you, and of course, you and John already have a relationship, but just hearing that, I want to just salute you and say we appreciate the work that you are doing, especially for those uh, that you are representing for the Black community to bring about that unity and that change, man. We appreciate that. Listen, so we've been in a series here that goes right along with what you do. Speaking of that one voice here on Unscripted, uh, for September, we've been talking about diversity and we've been covering different topics of diversity and different aspects of diversity, what that means, because we know diversity can be such a generalized term, it can be such a general term. And so for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, the different uh, unconscious biases that go with and affect diversity. And today we want to talk about systemic racism. Um, I'm excited to get into the topic, and I know that uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear what you and John both have to say and your viewpoints. And so we definitely kind of just want to lay a foundation 
education for those who don't know what systemic racism uh, is. It's systems that have been created, um, especially for those of minorities or those that are against black of the black descent of the black community systems that have been created and in place that uh, put us at a disadvantage, uh, whether this be employment, the criminal justice system, housing, health care, politics or education. Um, and so these are systems that are in place simply because of the color of our skin and going back to uh, laws such as Jim Crow and because of slavery and things of that nature um, that have set us back beyond the uh, goalposts and it's made us harder to achieve the things that we want to achieve as black people and as minorities. And so we wanna kind of talk about that and talk about what we can do to change that. Uh, John or Jeremiah, what's your, what's your thoughts on systemic racism? I guess let's, let's start here. Do you think that uh, just because we are in the year 2020, does this still exist or is this something of the past? I mean, I don't, I'm really interested to hear what y'all have to say about this and I am by no means the expert. But there's no way that I could sit here and say with confidence that it's just a thing of the past, right? Um, my journey over the, just the last few years and my relationship with Lafayette and the conversations that we've had in essentially private or over lunches have really um, changed my perspective a lot. And I've never been closed-minded. Um, and I've never thought, oh things that people are saying are incorrect, right? But I've never also not had the opportunity to really get the perspective from somebody else that doesn't look just like me. And so, I mean, I'm sure the opportunities were there. I've never taken advantage of them. And so it's been amazing just of our friendship and how um, we've had that relationship where we can, I can ask questions and he can ask me questions and we can come to these like deep conversations to really understand perspectives, and that's how the show started. Um, so no, I don't. I don't think that it's a thing of the past. I think it would be silly to think that. And I think having the attitude of this is a thing of the past would is is would be sort of be um, the attitude that would keep us from moving forward as uh, people, as communities, and as a country. So. Of course, I would have to agree with the way um, Johnny has come to these. Uh, now, I call him Johnny from back in the day. I apologize. Yeah, I do. You know, we, we go way back, man. So yeah, we do. We, we met in the 1900s, you know. Uh, <laughs> I heard of systemic racism back then. So anyway, it didn't come from him, though. I'm not saying that. So, <laughs> when, um, yeah, when, when uh, there are a million, mil, million reasons to try to pick apart what it means in, in the culture today of what is systemic racism what where does it affect what you know what are the ramifications of saying that it exists today yeah. um, so that's very important so i like the way you kind of codified it in these topics like healthcare or education or something like that like where what you know so he, here's the thing when we look at something very very simply that's not political we look at something in terms of the incarceration rate in this country yeah. Incarcerated. I think we can all agree. We all understand. There's been so many statistics. There's been all sorts of great uh, films that we've seen in very pop culture arenas where people of black and brown skin are oh, overwhelmingly uh, the numbers that end up in incarcerated in our country. So you either have to think that one people of brown or black skin are inherently worse they do things illegal they're bent toward uh breaking the law they're they're habitually acting out in criminal activity yeah. or you have to assume that there are things set up in our systems that have overwhelmingly put people of black and brown skin in those places so i'm not sure if you can come at it in a different form than those two either black people are bad <laughs> or systems have been put in place to get them incarcerated. So right there, I think you're gonna separate the men from the boys. If I ask a simple question like that, and I have other examples that I could give. Sure. So that's the kind of the question where I would go. So either you have to admit, and here's the crazy thing that I realized in 2020 is some people 
that I would never have known or never thought. They've actually said, yeah, well, black and brown people are more violent. And I'm like, whoa, because I'm thinking something like that is simple to say like, oh, well, there must be systems then. Now, that doesn't mean we agree on what they are or how they got people there, but I would think that it's pretty obvious that there are systems in place that have jeopardized the freedom, the ability to be outside of bars and not incarcerate black and brown people. So that's very something very simple right there. Um, that does not mean that we all have, um, that there is, there is a lack of, uh, uh, the other thing that I'll say is that a lot of people assume I think that in this country, because it became illegal to be racist in business in 1964, 1965. So we're thinking about the Voting Rights Act. We're thinking about Fair Housing Act. We're thinking about those civil rights acts of the 60s. Sure. That at that point, because they went into place and then when they were generally enforced, because it took a couple of years, maybe in certain places, especially in the South where I live that once they were enforced, that you could not be racist in business, you could not be racist in voting, then that means that the slate was wiped clean. And that, I think, is false. Just because the slate is wiped clean on that type of executive level or judicial level, that doesn't mean now we're all starting from the same point. And I think that's 55 years later, I think that's pretty obvious, but you know, of course you have to argue it with people and have to tell better stories and have better dialogue to help other folks potentially realize it, think about it for the first time, or maybe completely change their mind on something they they said, nah, it's not there. Yeah, man, absolutely. That was so good what you said, especially about the contrast. When it all boils down to it, it's either you just believe that because of the, the color of these people's skin, uh, that they are inherently more evil or there's a system in place because oftentimes what I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard, uh, Jeremiah, and even John, um, that black people automatically pull the race card as an excuse. And the reality is that I'm number one, racism is real and systems are real. These things are out of our control. It's not an excuse, but it's hard when you're working against a structure that was built against you. You talked about um, the incarceration rate uh, are those that are in the justice system that uh, have the same charge as a white man, a black man can have the same amount of drugs and he'll spend two to three more times in jail compared to someone who's white just simply because of the color of their skin. And so I'm so glad that you made that differentiation uh, of the excuse versus the system. So now that we know that these systems do exist uh, in whatever context it is, whether it be the jails, the health care, um, the community of how we vote, uh, housing, redlining and things of that nature. How do we go about breaking down these systems that are really higher than us? How do we go about uh, going and mobilizing change? Because I do believe the first step is education. But how do we go beyond now that we are educated? Because we've been educating people for hundreds of years. And so how do we move beyond education to mobilization, especially when the narrative is in high places uh, that racism and divisiveness is OK? How do we go about combating that? Uh, as black men, as white men, and as communities, as leaders, how do we go about combating that? Either one. Take it away, Jeremiah. All right. So, uh, so there's a couple of um, assumptions that you made that I would want to back up one or two steps first and say that sure. I don't think the education going into mobilization, you're like, so, hey, we're educating now, or we've been educating, or we're educated now, how do we go into mobilization? I don't think that the education has been strong enough at all, mm -hmm. um, first off. So not to, you know, argue with you right here, I just don't think we're there yet. Sure. And I don't think we're there on both sides of, if there's two sides of the racial divide, I don't think we're there on either side yet, either side. So I would say from the color of my skin, for those of you listening, I'm a black dude. OK, so when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at someone 
And coming from my side of the racial gap or bridge or river or chasm, that there is, um, and I think you alluded to this a little bit, is there is a certain level, no matter what, especially in a free country. So you have to look at this. So in paper, we're free. And in most procedural processes, you have the choice on what to do. Now, you have to be educated about that. And I think there's been plenty of systems that have held down the education. However, that doesn't negate my opportunity to be educated. So that just doesn't, it just, it just may mean that it wasn't given to me or handed to me or made clear. Mm. So I think that I have a responsibility. Now, I'm an able-bodied guy, right? I, I went to school. I went to college and things. That, I'm not saying that everybody's starting out even what I where I'm starting out today in September of 2020. But I am saying that, I mean, in every community that I've ever lived in, and I've lived in a few, uh, there in America, there are libraries. Libraries are open to anybody. And the books are free. All right? So obviously right now we're dealing with crazy times and pandemics and all that stuff. I'm not saying that you always have transportation. I'm not saying you know how to use the, the catalog system, wherever is Dewey Decimal that they taught us back in the day. And then that became irrelevant. And now we got the computer, just look up stuff. But my point is that the information is there. Yeah. Now let's get out there and have access to it. But you have to have a personal vendetta to take a step forward. A, I want to attack the idea that I have to stay here where I am. And I think a lot of people not don't necessarily, two things, know that the information will set them free. The truth will set them free. And secondly, of course, they're not really aware of, they're not really aware of the um, motivation. They don't have the motivation internally to go do it. And so I'm not throwing that out the window because I do not think it's someone else's job to make sure my dreams come true. So I have to start there. Now, secondarily, I did go to schools and live in towns, and now I'm living in the South, right, South Carolina. There's all sorts of systems that have kept information from me or given me skewed information or false information or information that was specifically serving a majority culture, and I'm not in that culture when it comes to the way I look. I'm not in that culture when it comes to who my family members are. I'm not in that culture when it comes to my family line of history. And so I've been, you know, there's tainted information I didn't really understand. There's a lot of things that are coming to light. I've learned by people who are in our age, the millennial and above. So we're like um, me, you know, me and John, we're in the older millennial category here. We're mm -hmm. in the first couple of years of millennial. And I think when we were coming up, we were given a lot of information that was very much skewed when it came to when it comes to these topics and now in a much more information society since the internet since social media when we we're going through college now we go wait 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 not all this information was right i think i was actually taught things that are potentially not true you know and that's what we're coming to and i'm seeing a lot of people come to that in 2020 so there so i will say that so first off i really think we have to start with better education Okay. And here's the thing. There are books, people. You got the internet. Almost all of us have put on, we put up our own stuff, like go out there and find that information. But at the second time, you have to couple that with a personal responsibility and a like charge and vendetta and a initiative to want to do better and get better and have a better community and have a better family or whatever. Because if you don't, I'm not sure it matters because the difference, right, between the person who can't read and the person who doesn't, is there a difference? What's the difference between the person who can't and the person who doesn't when it comes to reading or knowledge or information? So I think we have to start there. And that's a lot of what I do in my one man show is to help people change their perspective on what they think they know. So Will Rogers, right? That old white dude from back in the day, he had that quote that the problem in America isn't what people think is so or what they think they know it's what they think they know that just ain't so it's the fact that we think a bunch of things are true and they may be very much not correct information already so i think that comes in both ways in a person who's trying to get a leg up for systems that may be um pu pushing against him or pushing against her over the course of a long time as well as a majority culture of i am 
saying that there are probably a decent amount of things that you might think generalization majority that are just not true. So Absolutely. I, I had to go there first. I had to go there. So, so how much sure. of this, uh, how much of this info? I'm curious now. Um, so on the same, on the same, I'm real big on, I think a lot of what we know is being, has been programmed, um, not just in grade school, but on the information that we consume, um, the media, Hollywood, all those kinds of things. And so, as you say, a lot of, a lot of this is, uh, and that's what came to mind as you're talking about the education and then how much of the information that we um, as you said, how much of the information, what we think is true, isn't true. Um, I think a lot of people think of that as the information that we were fed in elementary school. But how much of that is relevant even today of the stuff that we willingly pour into our minds? That like, I, was, I was sat down with a young man named Kendrick. He had a great conversation of some projects he's putting together to help people. And he said, he was talking about programming. He said the television is actually called a TV program. You know, he goes, it's there to program things. And I thought, well, that's an, that's an interesting way to think about that. Um, so how much of that education is just on, you know, what we are willingly just allowing our minds to just soak in without actually um, differentiating what we should be putting in our minds versus not. I think that's a great, I mean, I think that's a great point. When I was in college, I studied mass communication and I took a course on uh, the media and, uh, you know, specifically just the media. And uh, we talked about the media. And uh, when we think about that today, we're talking about like news. You know, normally when we say the media, you're probably thinking about news and it's an election year. So it's always hot topics. But the media in general is not supposed to tell you what to think. Right. Mm -hmm. We can all agree with that. Doesn't matter. Left, right, up, down. And this is coming from a dude who went through college, got a bachelor's degree and didn't discover until about four or five years later that there was strategic bias, conservative and or liberal bias when it came to CNN or Fox. I didn't even know because I didn't watch the news. That's not why I was there. I mean, I didn't actually watch it, so I did not know. OK. And then I realized, whoa, a lot of people are talking about these people report different things. And you start watching like they do report different things or they report it in different ways. But here's the point. They aren't supposed to. And they'll all tell you fair and balanced and all this mess. Right. Just giving you the facts. You decide, you know, things like that, especially when it comes to election times. But here's the thing. The media tells you what to think about. Don't they? Absolutely. They tell mm -hmm. you what to think about. Because they're going to talk from 5 to 5.30 or 6 to 6.30 or 10 to 11. They're going to talk whether or not they got something to talk about or not. So they're going to help you think about something. And that is, it doesn't matter. When I turn on the TV, 24 hours a day, there are programming running. Just like John said. There's program running. So there's always something going on. And here's the thing. Well, what are the agendas and biases? We know that we're different. So if I had to run a program for 24 hours, well, I'm going to have an opinion about those programs. I think it's really important to understand. And there's so many things that are codified in different ways. For instance, true or false, if I ask you this question, either of you can answer, why don't you both answer it? Every year, inflation, prices go up. Is that a true statement or a false statement? I feel like true. the answer is true, but you're probably gonna tell me the opposite. <laughs> I am gonna tell you the opposite because prices don't change. There is more money pumped into the system every year by the fed and when mm -hmm. there's more of a certain thing it makes the value of it go down mm -hmm. prices do not rise there is more money and therefore it's worth less mm -hmm. right so this year the american government has put another whatever two to three billion i'm not here to be an economist what i'm saying is so every everybody next year is, is going to say wow prices have gone up again Meanwhile, they've forgotten that that's not really what goes on. Inflation is the fact that there is more of the dollar in the marketplace. Therefore, they are worth less and less and less. Here's another question for you. Here we go. Lafayette, I'm hitting you up this time. All right. My man, how long was the Hundred Years War? <laughs> <laughs> no, you get like, set up. Trick. 
question. I, I'm not going to say 100. Have you heard <laughs> of the Hundred Years' War before? Have you heard no. of it? You've never heard. heard of the Hundred Years' War? Oh, no. yeah, I definitely have, yeah. Sure, no. you have, sure. It's a war. It's a real I war. assumed it would have been 100 years, but it doesn't make sense that it would actually run for 100 years. Now that I'm thinking about it, right? 100 Years' War was 116 years. Mm -hmm. okay. So my so once so here's the thing, and I'm I'm with you like I just know it as an example I don't know nothing about it all right it doesn't help me make any money in 2020 yeah, no but idea. the point is there is a misclassification of all sorts of things around us oh yeah and it makes us think certain ways and think about things here's another thing that I would say is racism real I believe so is there a lot of racist ideas running between all of us. I would say yes. However, do you think the average person on your street or in your community is or would qualify in your opinion, not even their opinion, in your opinion, do you think they would qualify as a racist? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put most of my neighbors in the category yeah. of racist, no. I wouldn't either. Yeah. But I've been thinking that a lot more people potentially are racist in this yep. era than really are. And meanwhile, all the people I know, I go, now, I here's another thing. Now, I'll stop it right here because I'll say I do believe that, once again, between you and I and your neighbors, there are probably a lot of racist ideas between all of us. But I would not actually qualify all of the people as racist by the things they actually do day to day including their interaction with people of different flavors and shapes. So mm -hmm. I'll stop there. I just had to say all that, man. That, that's, that's good. That's that good. was really good. That's why when you asked about, do I think they're racist? It's a tricky question because to me, right, the, the way I view racism and races has shifted over the past two to three years or over the past four years, uh, just because of the things that has gone on in our country. Um, it shifted from, well, if they call me the N-word, they're racist. No, there are a lot of other things that has happened, um, even to how things you will view things politically and socially, um, that now I have to look at you a little differently. Uh, but I, I'm kind of careful on putting people, label them as racist. Uh, that's something that, that I struggle with. And so speaking of that, what you talked about the media, you talked about um, the more education. So... Do you think as black people, for us as black people, do you think it helps us to help um, when we say black lives matter? Do you think that helps to unify our agenda or push our agenda further? Or do you think that helps divide? Okay, now first off, I gotta, I gotta hit you again with, here, I have an opinion about that. Of course, I'll answer the question. But here's mm -hmm. the thing, is it a false dichotomy as is? Is it either or? Is, isn't that a fair question? Is it either or? We live in a two-party major political system as well, right, in this country. But yeah. is it really either or? Right? When you go to the, when you go to, and I'm saying I could break it down to the dumbest example ever, but when you go to the no. grocery store, you go to the grocery store and you're trying to get some ice cream, is it either or? Is that really how it works? It's either this or that? To me, it is. It's as simple or no to me. It, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Say it again. Say you broke up. To me, it's a simple yes or no. It's a clear for, does it or does it for ice cream? I think we oh. I think we I think we have ships in the night right there. So here's OK. So let me so let me jump. I think it's a good thing to think about. But here's the thing. I don't think it's an either or at all. Is it important? What's the either or? I don't think anything is either or. <laughs> I don't think anything is either or when it comes to this. Okay, so here's the thing about Black Lives Matter specifically. Right. Is the phrase important? I believe so, 100%. Over okay. the course of 400 years of America, it's important, it's powerful, it's making a statement about things today. However, here's my question back to you. Are you saying to me, potentially, that that has some bearing on the political system or is it just a phrase is it an organization does it mean anything to the community that's the thing does it is it either or so when i say black lives matter does it mean black lives matter 
or does it mean something different? Well, I'm saying that because I've heard both sides. Now, me personally, when I say it, it's because um, the attention and because of the police brutality and the things that are going on, uh, it seems that our lives have not mattered for a long time. Um, so what I'm saying is I'm hearing from other sides that, well, that's causing more divisiveness and we can't move forward in change because there are some people that hear when they hear Black Lives Matter that only Black Lives Matter. And then there are people that are saying, well, Black Lives Matter. We're not saying all lives matter. So I'm asking as Black people, should we say that? I know how I feel that personally, I think we should. But I'm asking you, do you think uh, this is helping us move the narrative forward or is it hurting? Well, I, see, I, I just think it's a more complicated question than that. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with everything you said uh, yeah, up yeah. to the point. Uh, I mean, up to the point of um, the, the po point is, is it either or? That's the thing. So did Black Lives Kid, I, I've had a show for 10 years. OK. And, and I have never used the term Black Lives Matter in that show because I didn't know of the movement of Black Lives Matter until 2016. Right. Did mm -hmm. I believe that Black Lives Mattered? Would that have been a good statement for me to say an important statement prior to the movement? Yes, 100%. That's where I agree with you, 100%. Now, here's the issue. When I say Black Lives Matter to somebody, does it mean something different than all the things that you said? And what I've discovered is it does for mm -hmm. so many people. So the question is like, well, when I say Black Lives Matter, what do you, whoever you is, what do you think that means? Mm -hmm. Can and I give a perspective? Know, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So, yeah, finish your statement. Thing. So like when I say Black Lives Matter, I mean, historically, there have been a lot of reasons culturally, politically, why black lives haven't mattered in a large place in the community, right? Like police mm -hmm. brutality. And then someone who has comes at it and goes, whoa, well, I think it's important that all lives matter. Do I disagree with the statement? All lives matter. No, I don't disagree with that statement. But the point is, like, is it? So what are we trying? You know what I'm saying? I don't disagree with it. All lives matter. Do I think that all lives matter? Do you think that all lives matter? I think generally speaking, if you take the politics out of it, well, yeah, all lives matter. But that's not what I'm saying when I say black lives matter. What I'm trying to say is black lives haven't mattered. Correct. So now it's important for us to talk about the people who are in jeopardy, the mm -hmm. problems of our system, yada, yada, yada. That doesn't mean that it's either or all lives or black lives. Well, I believe both, but I believe both for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't think that they're like, do white lives matter. Yeah. White lives matter. Thanks, but man. I, I'm not trying to save the white lives right now. You know, do yeah. babies mm -hmm. matter? Sure, babies matter. <laughs> that's the thing. Right. So like, I think that's why it's tough, right, um, to, to, you know, say either or. I mean, I was like, listening to somebody talk about this, and I so I hear a lot of perspectives too, right? Because I have a large, um, you know, I know a lot of people who are white, let's put it that way. And they, uh, <laughs> and when we talk, these things come up, I hear like, oh, all, all lives matter. And I think it comes down to, in my opinion, I, I don't always engage in some of these conversations because if they're not, I know some people are more willing to listen and talk about it than others, just make their statement. And I heard someone once said that, you know, Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that other lives don't matter there it's more of black lives matter too right like black lives matter also um and i thought that was an interesting way to say it like like no one's saying that other lives don't matter and so i think when some people say i've heard people just heard someone the other day who's, you know pretty close to me and they said they just made the statement that all lives matter and they, i think they're saying it in the respect that they didn't like the slogan black lives matter because almost like they felt like it was an attack like only black lives matter and i'm like well no i think someone's trying to say black lives matter as well and maybe it's time to start making that a priority as well um you know and that's okay it's kind of like when i love my kids right i don't like love is not a certain amount of love like i try to explain to my kids 
um, like, yes, I love you and you the most. Like, love is infinite. There's no, like, if I give you some love, then that automatically means I have to love my other, my daughter less or my son less because there's this, like, bottle of love here and they can only, like, you know, has to be an equal, like, there's a finite amount. And so I was just had this conversation. It was a really brief one. But I'm like, well, no, I, it, it's, an, it's an also, not an, as you said, either or. I think that's what you were trying to, you were saying, I could be wrong. Um, and then, but then the other, the other flip of the coin is, I think when some people, some people look at the slogan as a cause and some people look at it as an organization. Um, and so, as you said, take the politics out, but I don't think everybody takes the politics out. And so some people look at it as Black Lives Matter, the organization, which that has a whole other meaning because some people ag agree with the organization and some people think the organization is purely political and not actually for the good that some others believe. So, and they talk about the funding that goes to government, you know, uh, politicians and so forth. And so that's another deep the conversation. I don't know if we're going that way, but anyways, so of course, it is. Of course. And, I mean, and that's the thing about the statements like that. So when you're really, when you're really talking through these statements, the, the question is when you're talking to your neighbor, what does your neighbor mean? If I, as a black person in 2020, am championing the cause, not necessarily the organization, because there's so many of us who have believed in the cause, like you said, but not necessarily know anything about the organization, would agree that Black Lives Matter. And if someone comes up to me, comes up to me meaning Facebook or in my face, or I know them and like, whoa, 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 all lives matter, then my question is, why don't you think that what I said was important? And you can have a conversation with that person. It's a whole different ball of wax than it is well, do you think that this is a good statement? Do you think that's a bad statement? Because there's so many other pieces involved with it. And that's all I'm trying to say. Because, I mean, I have, because, yeah, because well, I'm not saying, you're right, because black lives matter. It's not even like black lives are better, black lives the most, like, black yeah. lives matter. So someone disagrees with me saying black lives matter. First thing, if they disagree with me, I'm not talking about people I don't know in Ohio, people I don't know in Kalamazoo, people I don't know in Africa. I want to know why did someone get in my face and say, well, no, 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 no. How about all lives matter or something? I go, whoa, what? What are you trying to say to me? What do you think I'm saying to you when I say black lives matter? Absolutely. Uh, great, great perspectives on both ends, and uh, <laughs> from you and uh, that was good. I feel like we were all saying the same thing. We kind of went down some different streets there, but we all came to the same, same reasoning on that. Um, but just to wrap this up, what are some ways that you think that we can mobilize the change? And we talked about the education, mm -hmm. uh, Jeremiah. What are some ways that you can give us that we can mobilize change, especially going forward? Uh, within the next 30 to 60 days, knowing that our election cycle is amongst us, what are some ways that we can mobilize change? I think that's a great question. And that's really where the commentary and the politics come in. And I don't mean like just the national politics of our one election, but it's a very important time. Uh, like you're saying, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg the in the Supreme Court situation that's coming up now. Um, of yeah. course, the uh, national presidency seat is um, you know up for grabs or whatever. And so it's very, very important. However, I'm a big believer in all politics is local. And so how do we mobilize? You gotta be mobilized and, and, and educated and accountable in your own communities, in your own communities. I think the black uh, American has been so disenfranchised for 400 years in this country and I think that now some of the thoughts of the average black American are not very educated, honestly. And I think that's potentially now historically, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not their fault. However, we have a job to do now because libraries are open. We mostly have the Internet. You know, we've mostly been to school here. So I'm saying like we generally have a level we can get to and attain. However, I think that you're going to have the effect the most change when you are, like I was saying, talking to your neighbor. I'm not sure what Trump, 
Biden or anyone else is going to do for me and my neighbor's conversation about black lives or all lives. And I need to have that conversation with my neighbor. And I need to have that conversation with my law enforcement, with my school board, with my city council, and whatever that means, with my church group, you know, with my neighborhood, with my street. So, for instance, in my one man show this summer, I did sit down and have a conversation with our sheriff in our county. So, it was the first time my show was a virtual experience. So, I'm doing Martin Luther King and I'm doing Muhammad Ali, all these other people. But then I went to the studio and I had a conversation. I sourced questions from the community, people who are in law enforcement, people who are out law enforcement. And I said, Sheriff of our town, what's going on? What would you say? How would you interpret this? Why? Because my life, my community, my neighbors are very important. And I think, honestly, most of us who get up in arms about our political system, think that our political system is gonna save us from something. I think our political system is what messed it up in the first place. Now, what I'm not gonna let them do moving forward is I'm not gonna let the political system, no matter who gets in that seat, both seats that I just mentioned, right? Presidential seat, judicial seat, I'm not gonna let them touch my local community before I touch my local community. That's good. Yeah, it's really good. Well, listen, man. John, did you have anything else? No, man. My brain is going. <laughs> I could do this. I could do this all day long. <laughs> yeah. So. This has been an incredible, incredible conversation, Jeremiah. Man, we appreciate you. I appreciate you. I know John appreciates you. Mm-hmm. You dropped a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom. Appreciate your perspective and everything that you have given us to contribute to this conversation and not to this conversation, but to change overall. Those that will be listening to this, I'm sure they will be informed and motivated to lead that change. And I love how you said you're not not going to allow the national stage to touch your local community before you do. That was awesome. So we thank you. This has been another episode of Unscripted Authentic Leadership. Of course, we thank our guest, Jeremiah, uh, do Jay do those of you um, that will listen to this, listen, man, what is your, some of your social media platforms that, that those that are listening, those that will watch this, that they can follow you on? Hey, fellas, appreciate you guys. Thank you for having me on. So if you want to keep up with me or follow me elsewhere, um, when I'm talking about my show, my Black History Show, that is onevoiceshow.com, onevoiceshow.com. And online, you're going to find me at It's J Do. So at I T S J D E W. Instagram, Twitter, and a Facebook page. So I appreciate you guys. Would love to uh, hear the feedback and um, get into the arguments. And once again, I mean, what I'm going to do is I'm going to chat with my neighbors and chat with the people yeah. who I, you know, who who affect my life and who I affect theirs to see if we can come to better conclusions because we're talking to each other better. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Another one of those ways to engage and to learn. Jeremiah talked about it. Going to your library. What we do here each week is we give our listeners and our audience a read of the week, um, give them some material to read. And this week, we want to give you a read suggestion of the week, What Truth Sounds Like by Michael Eric Dyson. Um, talks about James Baldwin and a conversation about race in America. That is a great tool that you can pick up um, that will encourage you, give you more insight and information on how to lead that change. Jeremiah, did you have any suggestive reads that uh, you can give our audience? Sure, sure. Yes. So uh, recently um, I finished Ibram Kendi's book, Stamped from the Beginning. I'd recommend that one if you want to uncover some of what I said earlier in the uh, cast about racist ideas. So I think a lot of people out there like you and I and others who should or shouldn't be listening to us today (laughs) would not qualify themselves as racist. And maybe I wouldn't either, but I bet you there are a lot of racist ideas that they have. And this book is going to take us back historically and help us understand where some of those ideas may have come from. Absolutely great. So stamp from the beginning and what truth sounds like. And then once again, those of you that will watch this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Keep supporting there at Unscripted Authentic Leadership. 
You can follow us on Facebook on the same page, Unscripted Authentic Leadership. Also on our Instagram page, at Unscripted Leadership, at John LeBron, the number three, and then at Lafayette B. Lane. And also follow Jeremiah at JDU. And also you can stream our podcast on any podcast platform, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Buzzsprout. This has been another episode of Unscripted Authentic Leadership. We appreciate your support. We appreciate our guests. And we are here to not build walls, but to build bridges. Bridges connect and walls divide. Until next week, God bless you. Thank you.